doing it. Well, I'm sorry, I've only got two more weeks. But, oh well. We've been, as I said, talking about generosity. And specifically, we have been talking about how to be rich. Um, Last week, we talked about the importance, very specifically, of generosity. And both the Apostle Paul and Jesus were, uh, frankly, uncomfortably clear on this topic. Rich people, and let me remind you, we are rich people. We talked about that the first week. We are rich people. If you look at the world's economy, if you're hearing my voice right now, living in America, you arrived by car, you had food to eat, and probably multiple choices for what to eat for breakfast. You can confidently know you're going to eat yet again today. And you have more than one change of clothes. You're rich. I didn't hear any celebrations. (laughs) But we are rich. And and I need to remind us of that. Because God has blessed us. We, We are fortunate to live in America. And as I was saying, rich people really honestly, should give more than the rest of the population. Rich Christians in particular, right? We should be known for our generosity. Now, this isn't to, to earn our way into heaven. This isn't a, a methodology to gain God's favor. The reason we are to be generous is because generosity is the antidote for the dizzying effects that wealth can have on us. But here's the thing with generosity. There's a, a, a barrier for us to incredible generosity. And until we identify it and until we grapple with it, we'll never fully embrace generosity as a way of life rather than just some random thing that occasionally happens in our lives. To have generosity at the very foundation of who it is that we are to be incredibly generous, we will have to eventually have to have uh, the ability, we will have to learn to say no to ourselves, right? We have to learn to say no to ourselves. And if if I know anything at all about rich people, is that they don't like being told no, right? I mean, the the, the primary, think about this, the primary advantages of having extra money is the ability to purchase stuff and and, and to have luxury, right? And to have that luxury of securing your future by saving up all that extra cash. But the, the kind of generosity that Jesus talks about, that level and sort of generosity will eventually mess those things up for us. See, money, money falsely satisfies some of our strongest appetites. It falsely satisfies our hunger for more stuff, for, for status, or, or for security. But the problem with hunger, the problem with hunger is that you are never completely satisfied, right? I mean, sure for an hour or two. But then you get hungry again, don't you? Appetites are never fully and finally satisfied. Never. Only temporarily. One of my absolute favorite restaurants on the whole planet is a place called Fogo de Chao. Anybody ever eaten there? My wife has. I have. Tanya has. I see a couple of the head nods. Uh, Kathy, I know because I recommended it to the Pearsons a couple of years ago. You didn't, you didn't get to go on that trip? Oh, you missed out. Fogo is this place in Minneapolis. And there's a number of them throughout the country. And it's a pretty nice downtown restaurant in downtown Minneapolis. And they, they bring you in. They seat you. And then they tell you, go help yourself at the salad bar. Right Now, normally, when a restaurant that is all you can eat tells you to go to the salad bar, they're trying to fool you into filling up on all the cheap stuff, right? Not Fogo. We got a picture of the salad bar, I think, coming up in a minute. The salad bar is opulent. It's, it's slices of incredible ham from Italy. 
It's, it's chunks of long-aged Parmesan. It's hearts of palm. It's the good stuff, right? So they're not going cheap on you on that. But when they sit you down at the table, they give you a coaster. It's kind of like a bar coaster, but it's not. It's a restaurant coaster. And on, on one side, and, and maybe we'll see it in a minute, but on one side it's green, and on one side it's red, okay? And, and the first time you eat at Fogo, many of you have obviously not been there, but the first time you eat there, uh, they tell you, you know, when you want meat, turn this over to green. They sit on the table, red side up. Turn this over to the green, okay? Easy enough. And when you do that, within seconds, men show up with these long, very sharp knives and delicious hot meat fresh off the grill. And then they start carving it right onto your plate as much as you want. They just keep carving it. And they'll ask you, because you can see like three steaks on there. One of them will be like medium rare, medium, and probably medium while at the bottom. They have it all for you, whatever you need, right? And so these men start carving off these delicious chunks, and, and they give you the best cuts. Every single one is the best cut of meat. It's, it's the best portions of beef, multiple types of steak. It's incredible preparations of chicken. There's, there's pork. There's sausages that are amazing. They come out with two different kinds of lamb. Two. How many of you have ever eaten lamb? Yeah. Lamb, it goes one of two ways. It's either incredible or horrible. This is incredible. Okay? There's no in-between on lamb. And they come over and they just start chopping meat onto your plate until you wave the white flag of surrender and flip that card back over to red. Right? It's a meat stravaganza if I was to be selling commercial time for it. It's awesome. And every morsel, perfectly, absolutely cooked, juicy, flavorful, outside is crusted, inside is juicy, the grease wants to run down through your beard, hopefully not if you're a lady. It's awesome. I love Fogo. It's a good thing we get to go have lunch in a little while, right? And, and when you go to Fogo, and when I go to Fogo at least, I don't eat beforehand. I don't eat breakfast that day. Usually... I go there for lunch because it's cheaper at lunch and you get the exact same food. So if you need a pointer, that's the way to go. Usually we go at lunch, so I won't eat breakfast that day. And I know, frankly, after I eat Fogo, I will not eat anything else the rest of the day. I promise. I am too full. That protein takes too long to digest. I waddle out of there. But here's the thing. You know what happens the next day? I wake up hungry again, don't I? Every single time. The next morning, I wake up hungry again. We keep wanting more, don't we? Even after getting a new car, right? Even after getting a better house, a nicer toy, eventually we want something more. And just like it's a bad idea to go grocery shopping, shopping when you're hungry on an empty stomach, it's also a bad idea for us to make decisions based off of our appetite for more. Saying no to ourselves is hard. And part of the reason it's so hard is because of a thing that's called impact bias. Scientists have studied this. When our appetites are stimulated... Our brains magnify it out of proportion to the reward that we will receive when we feed or satisfy that appetite. Part of my background, many of you know this, I was a waiter for many years. And this is why when I was serving tables, I waited tables at Red Lobster for almost 10 years of my life. And when I was waiting tables, if you've never, how many of you were eating at Red Lobster? That's a bigger portion of our crowd, right? The plates are big. The size, the size of portions are almost ridiculous for the dinner plates anyhow, right? And so I knew as a waiter that if I was going to sell a dessert, I couldn't wait till dessert time. You're going to be stuffed. You're going to eat those Cheddar Bay biscuits that everybody wants 20 of, right? You might have an appetizer, maybe a drink, 
And like three bites of your meal and you're full. I can't eat anymore. Take this in a to-go box. So I knew as a waiter, I couldn't wait. I had to get to you early. And so my plan, which I was very successful with, was to sell you a dessert early in the meal. And I'd come up and I'd tell you about my personal favorite dessert. You see, we had this, this dessert called a chocolate chip lava cake. Or lava cookie, I guess, technically. Right? You can see it there. And that's how I would make it. I love this dessert. And if you know me, I don't like sweets, and I love this dessert. So rather than walking up to the table and saying, hey, who wants some dessert? Now nah, we're full. Go away. What I would do... So I'd walk up and say, all right, you might be getting too full already, but I want to tell you about something amazing that I had after my shift last night. Last night when I was done working, I got one of these. It's the exterior is, is a chocolate chip cookie. It's absolutely perfect chocolate chip cookie. And on the inside is, is this molten core of chocolate ganache, truly decadent chocolate. And, and if you want it for here, I'll go make you one or two. You know, and then what I'll do is I'll heat it up for you. I'll put a big scoop of our vanilla bean ice cream on the top. I will drizzle chocolate all over the top for you. Put some whipped cream on it. A little cherry on the top. Or maybe I could just send a couple home for breakfast tomorrow. How's that sound? people would laugh and then they'd buy them. <laughs> and I'd say, how many do you need? Right? Powerful, huh? Yeah, today has a lot of food in a sermon. And if I had some right now, how many of you would buy? Okay, we have pie downstairs after church. Go there. And cool it. But I'm talking to people who are, who are paying 20 to $30 a plate for dinner already. They've already eaten probably two to 3,000 calories in a single meal. And I'm not kidding. I mean, I've brought buckets of butter to the table for people's crab legs. And yet, you would be amazed at how many desserts I could sell because I had stimulated the appetite. So while generosity may be the antidote for the dizzying effects of wealth, your appetite for more may be the antidote against God-honoring generosity. Our desire for more stuff, for status, for security, has the potential to kill our efforts to be generous. And according to the Bible, and according to God, and according to Jesus and the Apostle Paul, that's a problem. So what are we supposed to do, right? Well, we all know, the Bible says it. There's nothing new under the sun, right? So it shouldn't surprise us, the very same guy, the Apostle Paul, who, who called us, the rich people, to be good at being generous, called us to do many good deeds, it should come as no surprise then that he would address the obstacle to the kind of generosity that requires us to say no to ourselves. It's even in the same chapter of Timothy we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks. Paul writes this, and if you don't have a Bible, there's some in the pews, iPhones, Androids, uh, version is a good place to go. you also see it on the screen. Paul writes this in 1 Timothy 6.6. 6. He says, but Godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment, folks, is great gain. That is the word of God. Contentment. It's a concept we don't hear an awful lot about, right? And if we're honest, it is discontentment that fuels most, if not all, of our unnecessary, irresponsible, at times harmful spending right? So let me translate Paul's words. Contentment is more valuable than the things that we acquire 
because of our discontentment. You ever had buyer's remorse? Oh, yeah. I've had plenty. If you've had buyer's remorse, you know this is true. Paul knew what he was talking about, right? If you are really interested in gain, Paul says, contentment is the ticket. Then in verse 9, Paul writes this. He says, Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and and into a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Foolish and harmful desires are appetites again, right? And then in verse 10, Paul says one of the most misquoted verses of all the Bible. He says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Not the root of all evil, all kinds of evil. Some people who are eager for money have wandered away from the faith. They've pierced themselves with many griefs. So, so rather than being content and instead of giving our, into our appetites and into our discontentment, Paul says if we do that, we run the risk of these things, of falling into temptation, of falling into the trap, of being controlled by harmful habit-forming desires, plunging headfirst into ruin, plunging headfirst into destruction, Paul says, wandering away from the faith, piercing ourselves with many griefs. My guess is, my guess is we all know people this has happened to, right? And for many of us, it's us. Our appetites can cause us to make bad decisions and our brains, they deceive us. And we're not the first generation of rich Christians to fall prey to our appetites. So the Apostle Paul finishes his appeal with another set of appetites to succeed and to win. Look at 1 Timothy 6, 11 through 12. It says this, But you, men and women of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Paul says, flee, pursue, fight. Paul chooses some strong words. To avoid getting sucked in by discontentment, we need to be proactive, intentional, aggressive. Because you see, generosity doesn't come naturally. And saying no to ourselves is not how we are wired. It's an emblematic symbol of the sin in this world. And the more that we have, the more we tend to want. When are you most content? When you're maybe sitting around with your kids watching them play? Or your grandkids? When are you most content? Maybe it's when you're sitting around with a good friend just having a cup of coffee. Or maybe you're like me. I am at my most content when I'm somewhere in the woods or the mountains especially by myself where I can't hear the roads, I don't hear the cars, I don't hear sirens, I don't hear people. It's me, the trees, and the animals, and hopefully no bugs. Certainly no mosquitoes. That's my contentment. My contentment isn't sitting around at home piling up around me all of the stuff that I own. My contentment isn't when I'm out shopping or even when I'm out working in my garage. That's not my contentment. Though when I'm out riding my motorcycle, that is kind of a close second. And it's not because of the motorcycle itself. It's because of the freedom. It's because of the beauty. It's because of the experience of riding the motorcycle. That is my contentment. That is my joy. And Paul understood this, you see. In fact, he took this principle to its logical but uncomfortable extreme. 
He writes this in 1 Timothy 6, 7, and 8. He says, For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with just that. Food and clothing. Paul doesn't say food, clothing, and iPhones, right? No internet, no new Xboxes, no brand new deer stands or guns or fishing boats or new shoes or purses or whatever it is, right? Imagine how much money you would save and how much you could give if you were just content with the basics, with food, shelter, and clothing. I'm not suggesting it. I mean, I'd be a hypocrite if I did. But it's impossible to miss the point here. Fighting for, pursuing, and embracing contentment always results in gain. Every single time. At multiple levels. But we have to work for it. It doesn't happen by accident. We have to be intentional. Because you see, our culture fights this. TV commercials, right? Before my son could read, he saw this TV commercial for this thing called a cloud pet that through a Bluetooth connection to my phone, I could leave messages to him in this. He owns two of them, right? He loves those pets. One, neither of them work anymore. Our culture pushes us. How many of you, when that coming soon Thanksgiving paper comes, that's this thick? I feel so... I used to deliver those papers with my cousin on his paper out. Those Thanksgiving Day papers were so big we would have to go back to the house multiple times so we couldn't carry them all on his bike. How many of you, when you get that paper, man, you open it up, you're going to pull out Fleet Farm, you're going to pull out Home Depot, you're going to pull out Menards, or you're going to pull out Talbots, you're going to pull out whatever your favorite store is, right? And look through those and start paging through those. Or, or maybe it's when the Pottery Barn catalog comes, or maybe when it's Cabela's catalog comes. You get those, it's like, ooh, jackpot, what do I need? Right? Or how about just clicking on Amazon.com? That place is dangerous. They got everything. In our advertisement-driven economy, we are pushed to want more and more and more. How do we say enough in a world that has spent so much time and so much money and so much effort to make us continually dissatisfied with everything that we currently own. How can we, as rich people, how can we as the ones with extra money, how can we as the ones who didn't have to go this morning and break the ice to get water to drink or to wash our clothes, how can we, the ones who have so much to eat, how can we find the power to say no? How can we say no when we can afford to say yes? Well, the answer comes in a single word. A word that can work both for us as well as against us. It's awareness. You see, awareness fuels discontent. We see our neighbor and our neighbor has a nicer, newer, bigger, longer-throwing snowblower than we do. And we need a better one than he's got. No way is he going to throw snow farther than me. Or, oh, her shoes are cuter than mine. I hate her. But I want those shoes. Right? But awareness can also be used to tame our appetites. If you've ever given to an organization that makes a difference in this world, maybe one that fed starving children, being aware of how many kids that we could feed rather than make this purchase, 
for the newest, biggest, best, brightest, shiniest, bestest thing. Yes, bestest is now a word. Knowing how many kids I could feed instead of buying that. Knowing I could make a difference in their life by choosing generosity over consumption. That's a total game changer to have that awareness. Now I know we're not all called to be Mother Teresa and give all of our stuff away and then go and live and serve with the poor somewhere in India. But I think we could, most of us, if not all of us, do a better job of it, right? And if we are going to be good at being rich, then we have to begin cultivating awareness that really matters. Opportunities that make a real difference in the world. Things that matter to our Heavenly Father. It takes no effort on our part to be made aware of things that we don't have. Our culture is very good at doing that. But it takes initiative on our part to become and then remain aware of what other people don't have, but they should. And we have to be intentional about seeking opportunities to meet the other's need. We have to put that at the forefront of our thinking for it to continually happen. Not for guilt's sake. See, I'm preaching after we took the offering. I'm not trying to guilt you here. But for the sake of being good stewards of the resources that we've been privileged to manage. Every single spending and saving decision that we make should be made within the framework of awareness. There's nothing wrong with having nice things, folks. It's not what I'm saying. There's nothing wrong with enjoying God's blessing that He has poured out for most of us. Rejoice and be glad in that blessing. But always keep in mind that we are called as Christians to be stewards of it and not keepers of it. We have to control the environment that we are in. If you want to be made aware of just how good you have it, of just how blessed that you are, spend some time serving others who don't have it. I mean, when you are serving a man a meal and everything he owns is contained in a backpack on his back, when he has no home and the clothes that he wears are all that he has in this world, you become very self-conscious about how much you spent on the blue jeans that you are wearing and on how much you spent on the tennis shoes you bought last week. Helping a co-worker pay for a medical bill because her husband's medical expenses have wiped them out. That kind of thing can help with this awareness too. Serving at a food shelf, packing meals with Feed My Starving Children, many other things can put you in the environment to help you with this awareness. Now the way to control our environment is that we need to step back from some of those places and some of those things that cultivate our appetites in the wrong direction. I'll give you an example. Dangerous place for me, very dangerous, is driving onto car, car lots, right? I love to go to the Ford and Chevy and Dodge dealership. But it creates in me instantaneous want. I could spend all day looking at new trucks. Trucks that ride nice. Trucks that smell nice, right? Trucks that have lots of power. Pristine paint that I could wax. Trucks that don't leak oil all over my driveway. Trucks that didn't spring a leak last week in the roof, so now I have water dripping into my car. It happened. You get the idea though, right? For some, it might mean fewer trips to your favorite store at the mall. Or maybe one or two fewer trips a year to Cabela's. Or skipping that gun show. Or not picking up the most recent home decorating magazine. We have to stop unnecessarily exposing ourselves to environments that make us discontent with what we already have. Look for ways to become less aware of what you don't have and what you don't need. And by doing this, 
you'll leverage the power of awareness in your favor. You'll make it easier to say no and then to say yes to those who could benefit from your generosity. So as you go this week, limit your exposure to things that are going to feed your want appetite. And be intentional to control your environment so that you can increase your awareness of the needs of the world all around us. Then take the bold step this week. I dare you. Take the bold step this week of meeting some of those needs of the world around you. Bless somebody this week with your generosity. Give something out of joy and abundance and pour out your blessing with generosity into the world. Generosity is, in fact, the antidote for the dizzying effects of wealth. Use all that you have been given to the glory of God. Amen? That's how to be rich. Let's pray.